Hey guys, welcome back to Teen Muscle Radio and episode number 37. So today we are very lucky to be joined by uh, my good friend Matt Lucas. Now, a lot of you will probably know Matt already, but we just, <laughs> we, we, we've been going back and forth with this idea for a while. I know Matt has been studying hard, so it's, it's nice to nail down a time and actually get this together. Um, but yeah, today we're just going to have sort of quite a free flow discussion, getting to know Matt a little bit more about his background and what brought him into the sport of, of bodybuilding and also the fitness industry. Uh, and then also for any young YouTubers out there, I think this will be a great resource for you guys because... <laughs> Matt's managed to build such an awesome channel. Um, if you're not following Matt's channel already, obviously I'll, I'll link all the stuff that you need to uh, go and follow below. Um, but yeah, he's built an awesome following of, of like-minded individuals that um, are frequently you know, tuning in for his vids and not only just sort of watching but also the the community aspect and the the comments that you see on his videos are great and i think you're 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 killing it man so it's it's awesome to have you here and uh yeah just um it's great to be here man happy to be finally on it that was a very very nice intro to me yeah. <laughs> i appreciate it no very worries, kind words mate. no you deserve it no you're a very very genuine guy and i was lucky enough to to meet matt body power as well and just sort of catch yeah. up in person and it's and great. actually you made the point that it, it felt like we actually knew each other already like we just met the other day <laughs> yeah it's just, it's just yeah. chilled like i think we're, yeah, we're, yeah. we're very like-minded people we're just quite Definitely. chilled out and Definitely. we we don't have this sort of like I know that when when you get to a certain point and you're starting to grow like an element of a following, it's yeah. quite it's quite easy to get complacent and cocky. And I, you, I yeah. see that in a lot of people. I see a lot of that in body power, especially. It's just a, a melting pot of people who are either big headed or staying genuine. And you can see the difference like as soon as you start speaking to someone. Yeah, it's crazy. No, I totally agree. And uh, yeah, you know, I hope that we to our following come across as, as both quite genuine guys. So. That's um, one of our personality trait benefits, hopefully, right? Hopefully. <laughs> cool. So, um, Matt, first off, just basically give us a bit of uh, background on yourself. And intro. And more okay. so, yeah, more so just, yeah, like, obviously, for the listener that doesn't know who you are exactly, what, what do you do, um, okay. where do you come from, and, and what makes you so fucking awesome? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't know if I'll do that good of a job, but <laughs> um, my name is Matt. My name is Matt Lucas. Um, I'm 21 years old. I'm a student, university student. I'm living in Cork, Ireland, so that's probably why the accent sounds a bit funny to you guys. Mm -hmm. um, I've been training in bodybuilding naturally for about four years now, and three of those years I've definitely been uh, doing it as properly as I can. Okay. Um, first year, obviously, like everybody else, is very much an experimental year. Um, and I think I've gotten to the point now where my training has progressed from beginner to some sort of an intermediate lifter. And I'm starting to see kind of slower progress. And I'm sure we'll get into this later, but yeah. I'm somewhat of an intermediate lifter. Um, I do YouTube. I do vlogs on there. Try to portray my uh, bodybuilding process as best I can. Yeah. I also have an Instagram which I've been doing for longer, for about two years. And also I tried my best to stay active on Snapchat and Instagram stories, which is, I think, a very underutilized resource because it's like unedited, raw, and everything you show on that is is real. That's your life. Yeah. Um, and other than that, I don't think there's much more to me. Um, I make a bit of music at the side. And that's just a hobby of mine. Uh, yeah. But right now, it's uh, YouTube is definitely my main focus. Yeah, no, sure. And what are you studying at the moment, Matt? And how, so, how's that going? Yeah, I'm studying a course called Financial Maths and Actuarial Science, okay. uh, which is a four-year degree. And I'm finished third year now. So I'll get my results from my exams in two weeks' time. So I'm hoping they come out okay. okay. And uh, then I'll be going to fourth year in September yeah no I can imagine that's quite the demanding course and yeah. it's, it's interesting to hear that you're doing something that to me sounds quite diverse and different to what you think someone like you would do yeah um, yeah if I guess what actually got you into that what actually made you choose that course uh, <laughs> well 
throughout school, maths and science has always been my strong points. So I did all the sciences through what we call secondary school yeah. and um, did pretty well in my final exams for school, which is like the leaving cert over here. Okay. Um, so I knew I wanted to go into something sciencey or maths based and basically the choice came down to which gives most um, career prospects and uh, math science was kind of the most... It gave me the most options after college because you get all these skills in maths which are of high demand in a lot of areas, mm. not just not just in banking or in, I don't know, insurance. There's a lot of areas in all types of business that use mathematics and skills and statistics. Of course. So I feel like coming out with this degree gives me a lot of choices, so... That's basically why I chose maths. <laughs> yeah, nice. Uh, I, I I guess that you know when when people choose these things in in university. I mean, I, I know for myself, I was I felt really pressurized into making the decision with regards to studying, and and yeah, I was yeah. I was looking around lots of universities, thinking, okay, well, I have to make a decision, and then you know yeah. my decision ended up being that I didn't want to continue studying. I think yeah. that a lot of people, and maybe there's some listeners that can relate to this, is like when you finish over here, well, in, in England we have obviously the, you have college stage and then at the end of college you're sort of like somewhat rushed into making a decision on, on yeah. whether you want to go to uni or not. And it, it, you do feel like you're kind of pressurised. Um, did you have any time in between college or, or that stage in university or did you just go straight into things? Um, well, straight out of my leaving cert, which is, I think it's called the A-levels in the UK, if I'm mm. not mistaken. That's right. Um, yeah, it's basically, you get your results and you apply for a university. Yeah. And there's no kind of in-between stage unless you want to take a year out, yeah. which I didn't do, which 99% of people don't do. If they're going to go to university, they go straight in. Mm. Um, so you, you just make a list of the, you try your best um, to make a list of things that you think you'll be interested in as in courses yeah and I was lucky to have my parents were very helpful in making a decision that would be best to set me up after sure. university you know so I did have things down like sports science and I had nutritional science and I had food science down okay. as choices yeah um maths was the top one because of all the the just all the opportunities that could come from it and um I didn't want to go medicine I didn't want to go that route um and I felt that if I took math science if I'm if I got the points for it yeah. uh that the stuff that I'm interested in in food science and nutrition is just going to have to be something that I'll study on my own mm. and just not necessarily get a piece of paper telling me I have a degree in it you know yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's what a lot of people do it for is like sometimes they think they they like they need to do it for the piece of paper or they 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 need to do it for like potentially a job criteria or things like that which is like totally validated but then you have the ballpark as well that like they do rush and then they're like oh okay I've, I've must go to uni because I've I've got fuck all else to do yeah, um, yeah. and 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 you know that I think that's why there's percent like potentially a high dropout rate in uni because like people do like tend to rush into it exactly um, have you have you just like one more question on uni i know this yeah yeah no no potentially, potentially boring for the listeners but it's, um, I, think <laughs> it's quite, I think it's quite a good discussion because there's a lot of young listeners but yes, yes have you yes. have you had quite a lot of friends that have dropped out or pulled out of your course or other um courses? right so the the first year in my course is like it gives you an introduction into all areas of maths okay. and then after the first year you get to decide whether you want to go down like a financial mathematics route, an applied mathematics route, a physics and maths ma like route, or like an actuarial route, which is the way I'm going. Okay. And uh, a lot of people after the first year, they don't like any of the maths and they're like, I'm out. And mm. my course had had quite a few dropouts in the first year. And then it kind of like diminishes as we get through the course. You know, not many people are dropping out in second year and third year. I don't think anybody dropped out. But the class is small. 
Yeah. Um, as you can imagine, not a lot of people want to study what I'm studying. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in my actuarial science class, there's about 30 or 40 of us, um, about 10 females and the rest males, wow. and that's it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's so interesting. It's small. Yeah. yeah, I guess yeah, it's just like getting more specific and more specific with what you actually, exactly. what you actually want to do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's cool. Okay, cool. So moving away from uh, university and studying and and what you're doing currently, how did the whole bodybuilding thing come about, and what dragged you into the gym and fitness? Okay, well, my dad actually was big into bodybuilding. He did all the old school research. Did all had all the books, the encyclopedias, oh. tried all the protein bars from bodybuilding.com. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I guess when I was about 15, 16, I, or maybe, maybe 17, I actually went to the gym and he showed me the ropes, showed me how to use the machines properly, uh, do things in proper form. <clears throat> Excuse me. And... Um, it didn't. I didn't catch the bug like that. It wasn't one of those moments where the first time in my in the gym I was in love with it. Um, it was more of a case that like, oh, that was fun. Uh, maybe I'll try it again sometime. And it wasn't until like I was almost eighteen, maybe seventeen and a half. I went to the gym in a hotel gym when we were on a holiday one day or one summer, and uh, I just went ham on everything <laughs> and. Uh, in in this small little gym you know how hotel gyms are so I just like played around with everything I was on my own my dad like wasn't there and uh when I got back to the hotel room I felt like amazing all my muscles were like in pain um my abs I was like oh my god I can feel my abs like (laughs) you know this is this is uh this is what bodybuilding is right and uh from that moment then I was like yeah when I when we get home I'm gonna go to the gym I'm gonna go as often as I can so when I went home, I found the gym closest to me that let like 17 year olds train because mm. a couple of years ago, um, gyms were all like over 18s only. Okay. So there was one actually close enough to me that let kids train. So I went in and uh, I started going to the gym maybe twice a week after school. And then it just like progressed to like three times a week, four times a week and just kept going and going. Sure, sure. sure. Yeah. I mean, that's. That's interesting how your dad was into it. I think a lot yeah. of people, a lot of people have that, but then a lot of people, a lot of people don't and find like, I think that's maybe why it took you a little bit longer to feel like you loved it because it almost came, you were, had like quite an extrinsic force to push you into it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's like I anything, mean, like when you yeah. get sort of pushed into something, you have to almost find your own love for it a little bit later exactly, on. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I definitely didn't get the passion for it from my parents but they were a big part of it because both my parents are very like fit and healthy mm. and they still, they still train to this day. Um, so yeah, that was definitely like a persuasive like factor and it encouraged me to go, but it wasn't what made me love it. Like you said, I found that myself. Yeah, no, sure. So also with, with regards to like when you obviously you knew that the gym was to enhance your physique and you knew that you were going to look different as a result. Did you have any sort of like body confidence issues or were you um, happy with the way that you looked before you got into training and, and what sort of drove you to want to change your body in a sense? It's a good question. Um, so through school, I got got teased throughout school maybe. Um, I wouldn't say it was like, I wouldn't say it was like full on bullying, but I did change schools when I was like young enough. Um, I didn't fit in with like those kids or whatever in that school. So yeah. switched school, kind of became more introspective. And um, I never really had any like body issues, but I knew that um, changing your body through the gym um, was something that I had control over. Yeah. So when you're searching for like something that you can control like 100% the gym just came out of nowhere and was like you know everything that I do results in a change in my body and I can control everything so that's one of the things that I love about bodybuilding is that everything you do you see a result and um, I guess I, I, I wouldn't say I had any body issues 
but um maybe at some stage during my bodybuilding journey i was fixated a bit too much on um progressing physically okay. and aesthetically yeah but before it nothing nothing drove me to start like changing my body in any way i i suppose i was just a typical like average i had a, an average view of my body i guess yeah no sure i think uh, i can very much relate to you on that mate like i i i was teased i was i was quite like t- like, i wouldn't call it yeah, bullying yeah. either but yeah. uh, i was i was definitely not one of the popular kids and yeah. um that it didn't it didn't almost make me want to immediately improve my physique but it made me want to feel more confident and that's what that's what the gym gave me um yeah. and and you know with the with the control thing i think that's massively massively part of it as well like people people find control in different different areas and whether that's control of their nutrition or control of like the fact that they're there in control of the way they're going to look is like yeah. it's, it's just a, such a huge thing so for young people like that's why it's 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 almost it's so worth getting involved in yeah. in some element of fitness whether it be you know you, you're going out and you're running or you're going out and you're you're going to the gym and lifting weights like, i think it's mm. all massively massively beneficial definitely um, and did you did you sort of like play any sports at all? Did you mm. get involved in any sporting events, or or was the gym the first thing that you sort of found that that kept you healthy and fit? Um, I did dabble in a lot of sports. I never yeah. stuck to anything. I know that when I was younger, I did a couple of years of taekwondo okay. because my because again my parents did it, and uh, I got to a high enough belt in that. But it was never something that I was like addicted to or like really passionate about i just did it Mm. and it was fun at the time that was when i was about 12 13 then i think i tried every sport you could think of every physical sport that you could think of but for a very short like periods (laughs) because i just lost interest like straight away so you know soccer a couple months playing soccer a couple months playing like gaa that's what i like irish sport um I did gymnastics for a couple of like maybe months. Um, wow. I did, I did like, I tried everything and my parents facilitated that yeah. to be fair to them. You know, they let me try everything. I think that's important because uh, when I eventually stumbled across the gym, it wasn't until then that I found something that I was really, really into. Yeah, no, and I've actually, it's the only thing that I've stuck to for this long. So I it's, guess it's a sign. <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting that because uh, I, I see so many young people that are like that, that are very like they just dip and dab into different things until they find something that they, they, they really, really like. I think the variety and the diversity that you get from like, your training and your nutrition, like obviously the idea of like cutting and bulking, different movements, new new training sessions, new workouts, etc. And obviously YouTube documenting that, I think, that's probably why like so many people get attached to the gym process and they really really do enjoy it um so yeah that's awesome when you sort of like started to see your progression as a as a a trainee what was it like and did you think that you're quite a good responder to the weights room and did you grow quite fast and were there any sort of like comments from your friends like (laughs) saying holy shit matt you're you're ginormous (laughs) um i would say that in general i am a pretty good responder to um any sort of training yeah i mean i progress pretty quickly whether it's like training for a vertical leap or a bench press you know so physically i grow pretty well obviously that's starting to slow down now because i've been training for a few years but in those first few years I could literally see progress week by week, mm. especially the first two years, and um, that's what got me hooked, I think, and uh, it was all very fast, <laughs> it was all very quick, you know, I went in, trained, did the bro splits for, I don't know, two years, you know, chest and triceps, legs, you know, shoulders, back and biceps, and uh, yeah, I mean, I remember one uh, one day, my younger cousin said uh matthew your shoulders are wider than your hips and i was like <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> shit like yes <laughs> yeah. it's working like 
So uh, yeah, I guess I guess I'm a pretty good responder, and yeah. I'm still I, I would still consider myself a good responder to this day. So yeah, hopefully it you know. Yeah, no, sure. What did your first like years look like? Did you gain weight? Did you track your macros straight away? Like, what did those first few years look like? Oh man, I wish I tracked my macros straight away. Um, yeah. <laughs> the we first, yeah, the mm. first year, um, I'd say I was sitting around. 16 to 18 percent body fat okay. nothing nothing that you could really grab onto um but i would say my my weight was about 70 kilos maybe okay and um i trained for maybe five days a week the bro split mm -hmm. typical bro split and i was eating as much as i could as much protein high protein foods as i could and uh, <laughs> I think everybody's done this at some point, but I bought serious mass from Optimum Nutrition and thought it was going to make me Phil Heath. <laughs> but uh, yeah, obviously learned. Um, but yeah, I think the first two years, I didn't know anything properly about nutrition. All I knew was that I needed to eat mm. uh, uh, in a surplus yeah. and lots of protein. And that was it. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I've said this on previous podcasts before, like, that takes you pretty far. It um, does, it does. And it, that, what it does allow you to do is actually just enjoy being a, a younger person and, like, going out and potentially drinking or having meals out because you, you know, like, the minute you start tracking your macros, even though it is, like, a flexible process, you. Yeah. I, I bet when you go out or when you go out for a meal, you're still thinking, I know well, what the yeah. calories are. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And I didn't have that exactly. I didn't have that for the first two years. I was like, give me another burger. It's high, it's high in protein, you know? Yeah, high in protein. And, <laughs> but, you know, like it works. And yeah. I think a lot of the meat that is on my bones now came from those first two years of being fat and eating lots of protein. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, 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 that's it. I, I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. Um, I didn't track macros until I did my first diet. You know, I, I just, I just <laughs> ate, ate a ton of food and, and lifted yeah. weights. That's um, it, man. That's know, what makes you fall in love with it. That's it. It, it is. It is. It's, that's where you grow the passion. I think a lot of, a lot of younger lifters are now getting into it with the idea that, you know, it's so awesome that they're finding people like us that do track our macros and that do sort of have a very well thought out approach to our training and our nutrition and managing our sleep and you know but you gotta you you gotta expect that or realize that you know me and matt are at a stage in our lifting careers where we've, yeah. you know, we've been doing this for like sort of at least three four years and that's a decent amount of time to be consistent you know that's like five sessions a week for like three four years that's a long time yeah it's um, a lot of sessions <laughs> yeah it's a lot of sessions and and we're just trying to really eke out that final percentage. Um, and, you know, obviously we, we both sort of have competitive related goals as well in the future. And that's that's another driving factor and the reason why we're so uh, analytical with, with, our, <laughs> with our intakes and things like that. So, you know, I think that's a good point to take home from pe for, for people to think about. Is that, you know, they can have this element of being a little bit more relaxed. Um, Definitely. Cool. So when you were sort of like learning more and more about training and nutrition obviously this was like three four years ago so it's crazy right and i'm sure you're yeah. it's crazy how things have progressed because you know when i was younger i i was following a few people on youtube but nothing like it is now um so who were you following when you first got into things and like where did you learn your first bits of good information from Okay, so um, before I discovered macros and anything like that, I remember searching, just literally Googling or on being on like bodybuilding.com forums, just searching how to tr take my bodybuilding to the next level <laughs> because I didn't know what I was searching for. I was just yeah. looking for someone in some thread somewhere who said this is the key to taking it from I'm kind of bulky to... I'm a bodybuilder, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. and uh, I don't know exactly when it was, but probably three years ago, I found um, people like Steve Cook and Matt Ogis, okay. and um, I was like, 
like are these guys like like what are they doing that's so magical like how are they staying so athletically like aesthetically pleasing and you know like this is the le- that's how I want to look mm. so I was like I need to find out how how they do this and I think those are the first kind of guys that I watched um Chris Jones as well I used to watch him as well yeah he was one of the bigger guys at the start you know with physiques of greatness <laughs> um P-O-G. yeah pog <laughs> um but yeah, I wish I was able to say something like, "Oh, I found 3DMJ like three years ago," but I didn't. I didn't find. Uh, okay. I didn't find this like this this magical group of people who knew what they were doing. I just didn't. I found like random threads here and there that told me little pieces of information, and I just like threaded it together and found more as I was going along. Yeah, I I, I think that what Matt Ogus did was provide if you were. If you were following him for long enough and you managed to thread through things, you'd find 3DMJ because in Matt Ogus's first ever contest prep, he was coached by um, 3DMJ. Exactly. So, like you, if you look back, like, and people won't do this, but if you do look back, there's still some gold in like Matt oh, Ogus's yeah, yeah, really yeah, yeah. old videos. Like, it's so funny when like he was because he he was first introduced the idea of tracking macros and like. He was so obsessed with this like meal plan. He he, sh- he showed everyone like he walked through his like meal plan, and then and then he started getting more flexible with his food options. And now obviously he's like dieting on Chipotle, and like, yeah. it's so funny to see how different he is. Yeah, yeah. In the past, you had like these baggies full of like fifteen grams of almonds, and that was <laughs> yeah. then that was it, and it was every single day. And you know, it's, yeah. it is funny to see how people progress. But I think. You know, like we said at the start of this this question, it's it's crazy to see how things have developed so much because, you know, now if like if you were a young guy now, mate, like where would you go? What what would you, who would you follow, and and where would you start looking for information if you were in your position, like three yeah. or four years ago? Okay, yeah. So exactly, like right now is the best time, it like it's ever been to find information and. The fitness industry and bodybuilding in general has just blown up to the point where almost every fitness YouTuber is putting out information about macros. Yeah. Pretty much every single one. There is still some shite out there, though. Just to, oh, there's, just to there's still, <laughs> There is, yes, yes. But I would definitely go to 3DMJ. Um, their YouTube channel is just information on top of information. Mm. But... It might not be presented as nicely as like, who you know, like you know, Steve Cook's videos or Rob Lipsitz. Like you know, it's not presented in such a flashy way, but it is gold, like you yeah. said. Um, so I would watch 3DMJ's videos. Um, who would you follow <laughs> on Instagram? Who would I follow? Oh, you of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would follow Nunez. Um, I would follow Matt Ogus. I would follow any of the three DMJ guys, really. Okay. And I would try and find um, body natural bodybuilders are hard to find. Like really, like the the top guys are really hard to find on Instagram because they're not actually documenting it. Some as, of them are quiet uh, as well. Some of them are very quiet and they kind of pop out of nowhere and they're just like, "Damn, this guy's been training for like thirty years and he looks like he's not giving out information." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just like you know they're just they just have so much info. But um, I mean, there's not much more than that I can think of. Um. Okay, in so terms of following people, yeah, you'd really recommend like three DMJ. I, I, t- I, t- I totally agree. I think, I think what what you can do as a young person, like if you're listening to this, like follow three DMJ and then look up like, like go through their posts and then look up featured or like related um, Instagram accounts. And the py- the pyramids. Don't forget about the pyramids. <laughs> yeah, of course, the pyramids of peace. Like, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I've um, I I invested in them a long time ago, and they're they're like for. For, for building like your base level of knowledge yeah. and just getting an idea of how you can set yourself up they're like awesome yeah. i um, wish i wish they were around a few years ago because as i was reading them when i got them i was like this is the thing these are the things that i've been doing like yeah. it's good to it's good to be reassured that 
a lot of the things I was doing was correct, but imagine if I'd found that three years ago. Yeah. It would have been handy, you know. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you will always look back and you'll think, how could I have like optimised the progress that I've made? But, yeah. at, you know, at the same time, people are going to make a great start by sort of getting into the gym and doing something they, they, they just really enjoy. And, and that's, you know, the bottom level of the pyramid is going to be your adherence to a to a protocol, whether it's be being training or nutrition. So, like, setting yourself up with something that you just simply can't follow is just yeah. going to be extremely tough. Um, yeah. so sort of how is your how is your training itself like evolved over time and and obviously you started with the with the bro splits and um, I'm imagining you've tried a lot because I've been following your YouTube for a while so how, what does your training uh, how has it evolved right so I started with the bro splits probably did them for two years I would say okay and then I started to focus more on training weak points and you know priority principle and um i would go would go in and train shoulders four times a week just wow. because i wanted big bigger shoulders okay. um and yeah it worked Very but nice. i was neglecting other parts of my body um and i eventually came to training with legs push pull because okay. I, I found that volume training obviously like volume training is the way to go i need to get as much in as i can um, I need to hit my muscle groups every 48 hours as often as I can and uh, that's what get, got me into legs push pull and I would never turn back from legs push pull to be honest yeah. I've tried I've tried full body splits yeah, I um, that. which I would recommend if you have like if you have limited time in the gym as in you can only get to the gym three to four times a week then full body split is your friend yeah but i'm looking to optimize my results i'm looking to get as much out of it as i can and i can get to the gym six seven days a week so i will do legs push pull and um i would definitely recommend it to anybody young starting off legs push pull is great um sure the bro split worked for me and it will work for other people but i feel like legs push pull you're you're ahead of where you would be if you did a bro split, you know? Yeah, no, sure. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, for for younger trainees who who are looking at that and thinking, oh, but you know, I I why or like what why not the bro split? Obviously, we're we're talking primarily about your your frequency is going to be increased, and like yeah. Matt said, over the course of your training week, you're probably going to be able to fit in slightly more training volume, and also the training volume that you're doing in the legs push pull versus the bro split is going to be of a higher quality because when you do your shoulder day, like you get to the ed you get to the end of your shoulder day after doing 18 shoulder exercises, <laughs> and you finish up that last one, and that last one is shit, or the last three yeah. are shit. Um, yeah. So you're essentially doing a lot of junk volume in the gym, um, exactly. And that's what you see, unfortunately, quite a lot of kids doing is they'll they'll start off with like three really good exercises, and the form will be great, exercise execution will be awesome, and full yeah. range of motion. And then by the end of the session, like they're dragging their ass, and yeah. that's why you know that's why you see some physiques that are just like massively underdeveloped and they're not really growing to a to a, to the greatest degree that they can so setting up your split like taking into account frequency is going to probably be yeah key as fr like a young frequency trainer. definitely you need to get into the gym and train that muscle as often as you can mm. i mean in the words of ct fletcher like train arms every day <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah that that's that's the idea frequency and volume they're your friends yeah absolutely um so with your your youtube channel mate how did how did that begin and and where did the idea of becoming a, a quote-unquote youtuber come from um man, man i can't remember specifically but by the time i started there was quite a few people out there doing it like chris jones matt ogus steve cook um obviously the quality and standard of videos wasn't like it is now mm. like there's just been this explosion in quality over the last like maybe year or so but when i started i was watching those guys and i said look there aren't that many teenagers out there documenting um so i was 18 at the time that i bought my first camera which i still have over there 
<laughs> which somebody some people might be interested in. I had a a PowerShot S one ten. <laughs> Decent camera, right? Yeah. Went down to my kitchen and started filming myself, uh, saying, "Oh, my name's this, what, whatever. I've been training, blah, blah, blah." Um, and I made the video, deleted it, didn't like it, uh, didn't want to put it up on the internet. And it wasn't until a year later, when I was nineteen, I was like, "Look, I'm going to be prepping for a competition, so I'm going to make a video and I'm going to put it up." And I did it, and I put it up, and I was. Oh, I hated the video. <laughs> I thought it was. I thought it was so cringy. Um, but of course, like when anything happens in a small town, people from all over are watching it, and it got a good few views. So it's it's like, oh, I'm gonna make it on YouTube. This is gonna be it. Uh-huh. Uh, so I just went from there. Uh, put up a video a week for twelve weeks. Um, I got maybe a thousand subscribers after like five months six months and i was like i was like damn this is gonna this is gonna blow up and like little did i know that it's a massive struggle (laughs) but uh um yeah i mean like that's how it started and people always ask me um how to start a youtube channel Mm. and people are always saying like oh i've been looking up the best this and the best that the best camera the best editing software I've been looking. I've been yeah. I've been I've been looking at uh, statistics on how to get subscribers, and you know, in as in the least cheeky way possible, of saying this, the best way to get subscribers is to upload video, is to upload videos, and none of these people who are asking me how to start YouTube channels have done that. They're just asking and like being way too like afraid to start and like you can't get subscribers if you don't have videos up that's that's the thing that like that people seem to be missing that's the thing you need to upload (laughs) yeah i think i think i heard casey naistat say that in one of his videos he said just like just just keep keep uploading yeah Yeah. um and i that you know that's something that uh, my my youtube channel is very small and it's in its growth but in a sense like that's what i've learned from my video content is that the more frequent and consistent that i am with the content the the rate of growth just like keeps coming keeps yeah. coming but the, the is is the it's the week or the two weeks that you miss that send you back like a month yeah. in progression and you're and like, right now Fuck. i'm feeling that right now man because you know over my exams i didn't upload that often for about a month and right now i'm like bottom of a ramp again and we're trying to get it back up trying to be consistent and yeah i mean it's a numbers game youtube favors channels who pump out content every day because it brings people to the site um a lot of the bigger channels who don't upload every day aren't growing as fast anymore um because youtube works with advertisers advertisers put ads on videos and the people who upload the most videos will get the most attention because YouTube will push them to the top. I mean, like, it's a struggle of quality versus quantity, and uh, there's a balance that you just have to find yourself. Yeah. What do you think that balance is? Uh, For everyone, they're going to have different standards that they can, like, upload and be confident with. I wouldn't upload every day because I know that the videos would not be the quality and standard that I want them to be. Sure. Right now, I'm searching for my standard of quality that I want to provide in each video, and I think I would be able to upload three of those videos a week. Nice. Um, so that's what I'm going to aim to do for this whole summer for the next four months, and hopefully um, that won't be too little or too few. Um, so. Nice. we'll see where it goes <laughs> some nice growth i think that some th- some things that people are afraid of and you said it yourself like you recorded a video and you didn't want to put it up yeah I, I, i'll be honest like I, i'm always honest like i never really struggled with that i don't think that i ever looked at myself and thought this is cringy i think but that yeah. was maybe because i knew that there were a lot of people like i followed yourself for quite some time and i knew that there was a lot of people like me that were doing it um yeah. However, if you ask me to look back at some of my first videos now, I look at them and I think, <laughs> wow, they are shit. Like, they are rubbish. Um, yeah. And it's not so much their shit because, like, 
I don't, I don't like we, like we said. If you put out great content, then the 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 people will come eventually. Like Jeff Albert's videos, who I had on the podcast last, like he's sitting there with a headset with a poor quality webcam and a yeah. and a dodgy microphone, and he's just talking talking shop, and everyone loves it. Like I love yeah. that. And it's the same with Nunes, like. Um, some of his Instagram videos he's got like Mario Kart Mario <laughs> yeah. Kart music in the background like, you know it's, it's not like this crazy production quality and I but think but that's yeah yeah I think if it, mate if Nunes put up a video and it was like filmed Christian Guzman style I'd comment saying I don't want to see this I'd say I'd want to see the old like the, I want to see like the Perfor- perform ad-, ad Astra vlog yeah. I want to see that like I just want to see yeah him. I mean the thing is like the support that guys like Jeff Alberts and Nunez will get on their YouTube channel is is going to be as genuine as support gets yeah because there's nothing else drawing them in other than the person and the content there's nothing there's none of this as Lex Griffin said flashbang bullshit yeah there's nothing like crazy cinematography there's nothing like fancy editing um it's just the content that you're going for and that's why the people who watch those videos genuinely have like a community Mm. and genuinely are like supporting them for what they're putting out you know yeah i agree and you know that's that's something that i think people need to be very aware of is that the thing that's going to grow your channel at the same time is just being yourself and being you um and like you know i talk to you and you're exactly the same as you are in your videos and, and <laughs> you know someone else that i like rob let it i had on podcast as well he's exactly the same on an hour-long podcast that he is yeah. on his videos yeah. Um, yeah and that's super nice to see because i know that and you've probably seen it isn't there quite a lot of people that are like just not the same yeah a fake. lot of people try to emulate a certain persona and then when you meet them in person it's not quite the same yeah. unless they're in like a public place or they're at some sort of like body power let's say yeah. i saw this at body power a lot of these people who created personas on their youtube channel were trying to live up to that persona in real life mm. and you just can tell that like that's not a real thing you know it's not their real personality yeah. but that being said um the genuine people will make it to the top they will be found um because it might not be obvious, but people can detect when someone's not genuine on camera. Yeah. You can, you can, you can inherently, I think we all can see when someone is being genuine and someone's not. And you can see the channels growing if they're genuine. Totally, totally. Yeah, you can spot it a mile off. And if you can't spot it, then uh, you're just one of the, the brainwashed people that are following these people. <laughs> exactly. Like so, fake. Um, <laughs> so, Matt, I know that you've competed, but you what i see is that you when you did compete you did speak about it and you did follow the journey um but you don't tend to speak about it that often now um (laughs) and you don't tend to sort of look back on it or like post flashbacks or or (laughs) throwback thursdays or anything like that now is there a reason behind that and what are your views on competing and yourself moving forward as a as a bodybuilder what are your views Right, so the first competition I did, for those of you who don't know, uh, was when I was 19 and I did a natural bodybuilding show in Ireland. It was like a a national show and I was in the teen category, so it was 19s and under. Yeah. And there was five people in my class, Mm -hmm. all of which I was older than, um, and I came third. (laughs) So obviously not the result I was looking for. But I knew why I didn't come first or why I didn't like place higher because um, <clears throat> towards the end of the cut, I stopped taking it seriously. I went on a holiday and I was like, oh, it'll be fine. I'll, I, I have 10 days when I come back from the holiday and I'll do loads of cardio. And at that point, I just stopped caring. Mm. And even, what, even, even like 10 days out from the competition, I was like, look, I don't really care that much. I'm just going to enjoy it and go on stage and see what it's like. I think that's that wasn't necessarily a smart move because um, I kind of I sold myself short, <clears throat> but at the same time I like how I put more focus on enjoying it, okay, rather than uh, going in it to win it because I was like, look, it's my first show. I was trying to look at it positively <clears throat> after like you know take not taking it seriously, 
Um, and I went up and I was I was bigger than the guys on stage. Uh, if you're watching this, guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. But I, I was the oldest too. I was 19, like so. I had the the most muscle on stage, but I just wasn't the leanest. And it's the the leanest guy won. Um, he was younger than me, but he he won. He was leanest on stage, so um, couldn't argue with it. I I really enjoyed the day. It was a buzz being on stage. Um, all the people b- backstage. All the, I feel like there's a certain thing in natural bodybuilding competitions that everybody is like it's there's compet there's competitiveness there but everybody's like really nice to each other and it's really it's a really good atmosphere yeah which cannot be said for <clears throat> other shows that may or may not be tested <clears throat> i agree also um so i actually had a conversation with another natural bodybuilding friend of mine yesterday about this who went to um, a national competition that isn't tested mm. and uh, he was saying that like backstage people were just re- like really it was cutthroat atmosphere you know every man for himself it just wasn't like a good vibe so all that aside the reason I don't really talk about my first competition anymore is because I'm not sure if I want to be a competitive bodybuilder okay um based on the fact that I don't see myself like succeeding as a competitive bodybuilder. I see myself succeeding more as like somebody who promotes a healthy lifestyle, okay. a, a well balanced lifestyle. Somebody who can who can who can get a degree in something, um, nail their training, nutrition, just be on top of their life in all aspects. Um, and if competing comes around sometime in the future, I think it won't be next year. It might be the year after because I feel like I've a bit of mass to put on still, and it will take longer at this stage of my training to get to where I want to be to compete in a category like a juniors category. Sure. Because I'm still only 21, so if I was competing in junior category, it'd be I don't know how they do it. I think it's under 24s. Um. So who knows? I w- I'm hoping that I can uh, get into some sort of classic physique competition because yeah. that would be more suited to me. Just like my shape, um, I would I think my shape is more of a classic physique shape rather than a an, a straightforward bodybuilding shape or even a men's physique shape because I I think I was saying this yesterday to the in the conversation I was having with my friend that. Um, physique men's physique is attractive but uh my physique doesn't look as good without my legs <laughs> so so i think if i am to compete not saying that i will it'll be in like two years time and it'll either be classic physique or bodybuilding and if it really comes down to it i'll do a physique show but um we were also saying that competing abroad would be a better option for people in ireland because there's not a very big natural bodybuilding scene in Ireland. Okay. The competition that I took part in was the second year that competition ever took took place. So that was three years ago. Um, it's not a big federation. It's very small. And uh, there's not many opportunities coming out of it, even if you did place first. So I might come to England or who knows, wherever. Yeah, I mean, there is, um, there is a BNBF show in Ireland now. It's actually this weekend coming up. Oh wow! I did not yeah. know that at all. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm not sure whereabouts. I'll... It must be Northern Ireland, is it? Yeah, it may well be, mate. Yeah, yeah. But um, you know, drop a few pounds and go up and enter. <laughs> I'm, well, I'm, su- I'm supposed to be maintaining a lean physique, so I should be only a few pounds off. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, no, I I was gonna ask you as well about the sort of the men's physique thing and your opinions and. And whether you sort of think that you fit the bill with regards to bodybuilding or physique. And, and to be honest, mate, like from my critical coaching eye, I totally agree. I think that your physique is more suited to a bodybuilding stage than a physique stage. I think you look like you look great in physique shots, but yeah. your legs are so good that it'd be such a shame to, to waste <laughs> them. Um, yeah. And, you know, like from from a sort of development perspective, I think if you if you were to get like lean lean like for your first show like when you were 19 you weren't lean enough and you know that like Mm -hmm. um 
So, you know, if you were to get lean, lean, I think you'd, you'd do very well because, you know, you're very muscular. You've got a lot of tissue on your frame. Um, <laughs> but, yes, it, it is interesting. And, like, it's, it's good to hear your opinion on that. And I think that your idea and your perspective on things is, is great with regards to, like, just having the mindset that you that you know you've got a following and that you know that people are going to be watching your videos and developing a perspective of what it's like to be in the fitness industry and and be balancing university with that also and and you know the idea of maintaining a good physique is is really nice to see um because the idea of that is put astray by the bodybuilder because me being a bodybuilder I wouldn't want to spend time maintaining a lean physique or maintaining a a, a physique that doesn't allow me to put on tissue as much as I can, like yeah, 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 you know, yeah. get as strong as I can. So it's like a limiting factor for a bodybuilder. But yeah. for a guy that wants to be marketable and put across this look, I think it is an option. Like if you see, if you look at Matt Ogus, like Matt Ogus is a great competitive bodybuilder. Didn't didn't turn, didn't turn up on, in shape at his show because he messed up, but he now puts across the the image that that you can stay in relatively good shape like year round but if like we said at the start when we were looking back at old videos if you look back at matt ogus's old videos man has that guy got a moon face and gets <laughs> like he got heavy and yeah. strong like he pulled like a 600 pound deadlift a 500 pound yeah. squat um you know so the the main the main building blocks is that if you're like 15 16 and you're like trying to do what matt is already doing that's going to be a little bit difficult because you're not going to be you're not going to be muscular enough to do that or to worry exactly. doing that i don't think. i think i think that's an important point to make is that you see a lot of these guys who have been training for years can stay lean and that is why they can stay lean because they've been training for so many years they've got this tissue on their frame that burns more calories than what your tissue does yeah. so I mean, I'm getting to the stage now, like I said, I'm getting to an intermediate stage where I have a certain amount of muscle on my frame mm. and it's easier for me to stay a little bit leaner year round. Yeah. And I'm not, I, I, there's a, a point of diminishing returns for the approach of getting fat and getting heavy to yeah. gain muscle. I mean, if I did that this year, I did it last year and yeah, I gained some weight but nothing like the year before. So I just it doesn't appeal to me to get to 18% body fat now to get those extra few pounds because if I stay leaner, I can get those pounds just over a longer period of time and I can get the benefits of staying lean as well. So Yeah, and stay more marketable, I guess, for the, That's for, the it, for the people that you're following you and like obviously you have sponsorships and and things to sort of keep hold of with regards to that. Yeah. So it does provide benefit for you to say a little bit lean. I do yeah. understand that. Um, cool. Awesome. Well, you know, I think this has been awesome. This has been a lovely, <laughs> lovely little chat and uh, I've really enjoyed it. So for for the listener, um, where can they sort of continue to follow your journey? Where are you most active? And obviously I'll link things below, but, but give them perfect, a place to perfect. follow you. Cheers, man. So this is the plug part of this, the podcast. Um, my YouTube channel is just Matt Lucas. You can find me just by searching that. I'll be the guy in this pose with sunglasses on. Um, I've also got Instagram, which is just it's Matt Lucas. It's Matt Lucas, all one word. Um, then I've got my Snapchat, which is Matt Lucas Fit. And I also do music if you happen to be interested in that. It's just maluka m-a-l-u-c-a not very creative it's just matt and lucas combined um so that's pretty much it feel free to follow me on everything follow me comment like do all that good stuff subscribe and i'll be happy to have you on board as a supporter because i do like to interact with my followers a lot of people seem to be sub <clears throat> excuse me a lot of people seem to be surprised when i actually reply to them but mm -hmm. i reply to as many people as i can Snapchat, Instagram DMs, everything. I'll try my best to answer. So if you have any questions or you have anything you want to say to me, please do. Don't be don't be thinking, oh, he'll never answer. He's got this many followers. I will answer if I can, and that's like ninety nine percent of the time. So epic. Welcome, epic. welcome to my channel. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so nice to hear, mate. And you know, like that's something that 
you should hold on to for as long as you can with regards to like replying <laughs> to everyone because you know your channel will grow i'm absolutely sure of it it would like to a point where you might not be able to physically reply to every single one but you can try your best um so yeah that's awesome guys um or listeners thank you very much for tuning in um this has been episode 37 we will see you in the next one matt have you got anything else left to say i just want to say thank you for having me on the podcast it's a Mm -hmm. pleasure and um up with all the big names you've had on it it's an honor to be on it as well so I'm sure we'll chat to get, chat again soon, man. It's oh, great yeah. to... No, mate. No, it's yeah. my, my, my pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. And, uh, you know, this has been awesome. And I, I hope that people can get what get what they want out of it and, and use it as a resource for, for younger individuals to sort of learn some more stuff. So, yeah, thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you to the listeners. Make sure you like and, and subscribe for, for future episodes and hanging around. And, uh, and we'll see you in the next one. Cheers, Matt. Peace. Peace.